Spencer Cox. He is a business owner and uh, an entrepreneur as well as politician. And uh, I don't need any more time. Get up front the stage. Let's give him a hand, please. Thank you, Josh. It's great to be here. Uh, this, is, this is incredible. I, I come to St. George all the time. Uh, this is one of our favorite places on earth. And uh, I eat across the street. Uh, the, the, what is it? Twisted New Year's, that's how I think my wife always takes me there. And uh, Pizza Next Door, uh, they have some incredible pizzas just right here on the street. And uh, I had no idea the space was here at all. And it's, uh, I've been by the gallery downstairs, I've been into the gallery downstairs. And uh, I kept looking at the address, I thought this can't be right. I said to come upstairs, and I walked upstairs and see this, uh, really incredible. I'm, I'm excited to be here with you, I thank you for the invitation. Uh, I, I get the awesome opportunity to travel around the state. It's, it's part of the job. Most people have no idea what a lieutenant governor is or does, and uh, it's different every day, and it's different with every lieutenant governor. But I live in a small town in Sandy County. Uh, if you don't know where that is, if you look at a map of the state of Utah, put your finger right in the middle, that's Sandy County. So I, I'm at the Capitol very frequently. Um, unfortunately, the Capitol is not close to Sandy County, uh, but that was part of the deal when the governor asked me to do this. Um, I have a 200 mile round trip commute every day, and uh, most days, other days, I'm, I'm everywhere else. And so yesterday I was in Logan, uh, today I'm in St. George, if you're not familiar with the geography of Utah, those two places are not close. And so, uh, and we have a big game tonight. We have a jazz game. And uh, we haven't had the playoffs here for a long time, so we're very excited about that. So today is a 696 mile day for me, but uh, there's nowhere else I'd rather be than with all of you. And, and to talk about something that's important, um, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the problems we have here in the state of Utah and how you're going to help fix it. We, uh, we're very good at, at talking about the accolades here, and, and we should be, and I hope you're familiar with those. We heard some of them just now. What's happening in Utah is truly remarkable. We're getting noticed in ways that we've never been noticed before. In, uh, in 2008, you remember very well what was happening in our country, what was happening in our state economically. Uh, things were fairly dire. The calendar changes to 2009. And uh, Governor Huntsman says, I think I'm going to go to China for a few years, and uh, I'm going to be the, uh, the ambassador over there. And kind of an unknown uh, lieutenant governor at the time, Gary Herbert, becomes the, the governor of Utah. And he, in his first major speech to the state, he got up and he said something fairly remarkable uh, and kind of crazy at the time. He said, I believe that the state of Utah can be the number one economy in the United States and a global business destination. And he was kind of panned uh, by the press and others who said, that's nice, you know, politicians say things all the time. Uh, they make lots of promises that don't mean anything. We hear that a lot lately. And, um, and so they, they just kind of dismissed him. And here we are uh, just, just a few years later, and for the last two years we have been the number one economy in the United States. And we are a global business destination, it's remarkable. Uh, again, a lot of people don't know this, I also serve as the Secretary of State. We used to have one until the mid-70s, uh, but when we created, uh, when the state created the Lieutenant Governor's Office, it was subsumed there. Which means that I get to work with uh, foreign dignitaries when they come to our state. And you don't know this, I didn't know this until I woke up one day and I was a lieutenant governor, and that is that uh, people from other countries are coming, delegations are coming almost every week to the state of Utah. If you look at my calendar, it's, it's truly amazing. Ambassadors are here, uh, consul generals are here, and they're here because they see things and they hear things and they read things and they can't believe what they're seeing and hearing and reading. Uh, and it, it's about this state whose economy is, is booming, it's about, a, specifically, the IT sector and financial sector. Those are the two sectors that seem to get their attention the most. And they have to come see it and see it for themselves. And so they, they come here with trade missions and trade delegations, and they, they look around and they're, they ask a lot of questions, and they look at the numbers, and then they say, we want more. How can we do more business? with your state. And it's been incredibly remarkable to see that happening. Um, I, I was with the, uh, the Laotian ambassador just, uh, just a couple 
weeks ago who was here trying to figure out how his company can do more, or his country can do more trade with the state of Utah. One of my favorites, um, I had the, uh, the Crown Prince of Luxembourg here uh, not long ago, and uh, he was fascinated. He, he, great guy. I uh, didn't know Luxembourg had a crown prince. Uh, I had to kind of figure that out. That was my uh, rural Utah education coming through. I barely knew that Luxembourg was a place. So it was, you know, it took a, took a, lot, of, uh, a lot of research on my behalf. But as, as he got, my, my daughter, by the way, asked, the, asked me which Disney movie he was in. The only kind of crown princes we know in our house, but a very educated guy, articulate. He'd been educated in the United States, um, big into finance in uh, in Luxembourg, and he had heard somewhere that uh, that Utah, uh, Goldman Sachs had a had a Utah branch with 2,500 employees, which is remarkable, the fourth largest Goldman Sachs. Uh, uh, business operation in the world, and so we came here, looked around, and, and, and they, they always ask the same question. We get through all the numbers and they see it happening. By the way, growth numbers were announced yesterday. We're still growing at 3.2% as a state. Unemployment rates at 3.1%. It's not very often your great growth rate exceeds your unemployment rate. That's, that doesn't happen. Um, in many places, but it's happening here. And uh, But we get through all of that and, and you just say, why Utah? I just, I just don't get it. What's happening in Utah? Before I answer that, and I'll let you think of how you would answer that, I want to share a, a second uh, thing that happened just recently. It actually happened a year ago, but, but uh, it just came out of the press a couple of weeks ago. There was a study done a while back by Harvard and some professors at Harvard, and they, they they found something unique. They, they found out that in Utah, more than anywhere else, this idea of the American dream is still alive and well. And, and, and they refer to it as upward mobility. But it's this idea that you can be born into poverty and not stay in poverty. That you, you can become an entrepreneur. You, you, could, you can dream about something and make it happen. And for a long time, the numbers have said that the American dream is not really that American anymore. It's kind of dying in, in the United States. Um, it's really hard for people who were born in the, uh, the, the lowest 10% to make their way uh, through, the, uh, through, the, through the other quadrants as they succeed in life, with, with one major exception, and that exception is Utah. And there's a reporter uh, for Bloomberg who read this study and said, I want to find out what's going on in Utah. So an admittedly liberal reporter from New York City comes out here a year ago, a little less than a year ago, and says, I, I want to know what's happening here. I want to figure this out. Why is the, the, the American dream still alive and well in Utah? Um, and he, to, I kind of forgot about it. I interviewed with her, and then because it took so long for the article came out, two weeks ago it came out. Any of you read that Bloomberg article? Okay, not one of you. If you haven't, please do so. I think you, you should. Uh, just Google Bloomberg. Utah American Dream will pop up. Uh, but she discovered some things. Now, I don't agree with everything in the article, and that's not what I'm here to talk about. But I will tell you that there is something that comes out every time we have these meetings and we talk to people from other countries or other states that are, that are studying Utah. And that is that there's, there's a culture here that's different. There are many reasons um, that, that people talk about for that. I don't know that any one of them is correct. I think there are lots of reasons for, for a different culture. Um, you know, the kind of, is, in this area, those of us in rural Utah, we have ancestors. I, I still live on the farm that my, uh, my great, great, great grandfather settled over 160 years ago. Uh, I live literally a stone's throw from where his house was. Um, you know, we don't get out much where I'm from, and, uh, and, and, and this, there's this kind of, kind of this work ethic that's important to, to, to us. Um, but it's more than that, uh, and, and, and the data point that I'm most proud of is that we lead the nation when it comes to, uh, when it comes to volunteerism. Uh, every year, uh, it's literally, I get, a, I get an award, and you didn't know this, but the lieutenant governor's in charge of volunteerism or something. And uh, so there's an organization that comes out every year and gives Utah an award for being the, the, the most volunteer state. We volunteer more per capita than anywhere else in the country. We're also uh, the, the, the most charitable state. We give more money to charity per capita than anywhere else in the, state, in, the, in the country. Even if you adjust for kind of the Mormon tithing thing, which I don't, there's no reason to adjust for that, but even if you do, we're still overwhelmingly generous when it comes to giving back. Now again, you're probably asking, what does this have to do with, with education or anything? 
right? But, but I promise we're getting there. Uh, so I'm technically a politician now, I guess. Um, this is what I do for a living. I, I hate that moniker. I didn't run for this office, although I have run for other offices. Um, our lieutenant governor resigned, and one day I get a call from the governor. A week later, I'm the lieutenant governor. I had a really good thing going for me. Um, we, uh, part of a, a business, a, a family business, and uh, we were a startup company. Um, unlike many of you, uh, unlike most startups, we, we were a startup company for about 100 years. Um, and it just always felt like a startup. So let me explain. So we were in the telecommunications business. My, in, in 1903, uh, there were some farmers in my small town. Again, we're a town of about 1,200 now. And, you know, maybe in 1903 there were 400 people there. We haven't grown much uh, since then. But four farmers really wanted this new invention. They wanted telephones. Um, they thought telephones would be good for their town. And uh, the, the only telephone company refused to bring telephones to Fairview. They, uh, they, had, they had agreed to bring telephones to the, the metropolis seven miles uh, south of Fairview, called Mount Pleasant, um, which probably had 500 people instead of 400 at the time, but they would not extend it to Fairview. So these four farmers got together and uh, they were entrepreneurs and they went and cut down tall trees and they got their wagons and they put up poles and they strung an open wire line between Mount Pleasant and Fairview. And in 1903, four people in Fairview got telephones. Uh, in, in 1919, my great-grandfather decided to buy that company from those four farmers. And uh, he put all his savings together and he bought it. I don't know exactly how many phones there were in 1919, but it, it, the, the company had grown significantly. I think there were probably about 25 phones at that point uh, when he bought that, that company. And he still had the farm. And so he had these, these dual operations, and the, uh, they, the, the employees were family members, and that was it. Uh, my my great-grandmother was at a switchboard, listening in on everybody's conversations in town as, as they would make calls. Uh, again, the technology changed over the years very slowly. Uh, it went to party line phones. Um, some of you may know what that is. Uh, they had an old switch that was there, but the company never grew. The company never thrived. The company never had more than five employees for the first uh, 80 years, 75 years, I guess, maybe. No, no, easily into the 1980s. And uh, so then, uh, then some things started to change. And I'm not going to go through the whole history uh, of the company. Um, but when I was a kid, I had a shovel and I dug trenches for telephone lines. That's just kind of what we did. Um, and, and this was an important part of our family for, for a long, long time. I, after I, I went to law school, I went to work for a big law firm. I, uh, one day we were driving down the road and my wife and I we saw a bumper sticker that said it's 99% of attorneys to give the other 1% a bad name. And um, it, it was a joke. Uh, and <laughs> so my wife explained it to me. And uh, I, I asked her a question. I said, is, is, is my life, you know, is the world a better place because of what I'm doing? We're here for a big law firm in Salt Lake City. And she said no. And that started a discussion. And so we got a chance to move back, uh, move back home to the, uh, to the family business and raise our kids on the farm. It was a big cut in pay, but it was a great opportunity for us. Now, I tell you all that to tell you this. One of the things that I realized, our company had grown at this point. There were about 45 employees. And uh, uh, we, we, I, I realized something very important, and that was that the company had developed a culture over all this time, a culture of giving back, a culture of giving back to the community, a culture of volunteerism, a culture of sponsoring the local baseball team, uh, helping the local food bank, uh, and, and doing a lot of different things. Now, I'm going to pause here, and I'm going to move over. One of the problems we have in the state of Utah has to do with education. Okay. We're doing a lot of great things, and we're doing a lot of great things in education. However, uh, th this problem is mostly funding related. That's the biggest problem. It's no secret that uh, we spend uh, less per pupil on education than any other state in the, in the country. A lot of people ask why that is. It's, well, it's not because we're selfish. 
it's, it's, there, there are two reasons. One, it's how we fund education. In most of the country, education is funded in large part by, uh, by property taxes. 70% okay? of our state is owned by the federal government. Now, whether you think that's the best thing ever or the worst thing ever, it's a thing. Okay? It doesn't matter, it just means that we can't tax that land and, and get the same type of funding that you would get if you lived somewhere else. Okay? So that's, that's just a fact. Now that would be okay if we didn't have the, the second issue, and that is that we have more kids per capita than anywhere else in the country. It's one of the things we're best at. We practice a lot, we're really good at having kids. And, uh, and economists will tell you that that's a, that's a good thing for your economy, right? That's, that's not a bad thing, that's a positive thing. And, and let me tell you, when I talk to my, my, uh, my friends, uh, my colleagues in the, uh, in the Northeast where their population is literally shrinking, uh, they're very jealous of, you know, they're closing schools right now uh, because they, you know, they don't have a teacher shortage, they, they have a, a kid shortage. Uh, we don't have that here. But when you combine those two things, it leads us to this, this issue where it's really hard uh, to, to fund education. That being said, we're still doing remarkably well. Again, we get more for our dollars than anywhere else in the country. And that's not just me saying that. There's data to back that up and, and uh, third party entities that will tell you that. So that being said though, we're on a trajectory that isn't great. And the world is changing around us, and the United States is struggling to keep up, especially in education. So not just here in Utah, but everywhere. So I'm sitting in a room full of innovators. Right? That's why you're here. This is, this is what you guys do. Uh, you, you break the mold. You, you find new ideas, you find a niche, and you exploit it, and you change it, and, uh, and, and society is better because of that. And yet, when it comes to education, we have had some innovation. Um, but maybe not as much as, as we should have. And so we started looking at the, at the data on, on education. And, and, and what could we do? How could, how could we do things differently? And we discovered something. Uh, this, this concept of work-based learning, it's something we got away from as a society. Europe does it a little bit better, uh, but we, we have not. You, we, we've gotten to this model where you, you go to uh, you go to elementary school, then you go to junior high, and then you go to high school, and then you go to college, um, hopefully, and then you get out, and then you go find a job, right? And you all know this in this room, that that model is, is deeply flawed. Um, it used to work a lot better because one person I was talking to last week told me, he said, you know, when I graduated from college, I had all the knowledge I needed for my career for at least the next 30 years. Because just like, just like my telephone company, nothing changed for 30 years. Nothing changed for 50 years. Nothing changed for 80 years. And then all of a sudden, everything started changing. And, and everything started changing very rapidly. In my company, we, we laid a fiber optic cable for the first time in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. And it changed, it changed our company. Um, today, now, there are over 100 employees and uh, a huge fiber optic network. In fact, many of the largest businesses you see on the Wasatch Front right now uh, in Lehigh and, and, and those new developments are running on, on my family little company's fiber. And it's, it's remarkable how that's changed. Well, the same things happened in, in just about every, uh, every industry. You, you don't graduate from college with all the knowledge you need for the next 30 years. In fact, the exact opposite has happened, right? You graduate from college and you're already five years behind the knowledge that you need. And, uh, and, and that's certainly true in the way we educate in, in high school. Um, you know, we, uh, we've gotten away too much from, from uh, tech, uh, career and technical education. So we, we have what we call our UCAT system. And uh, we, we, need to, we need to get back to that. Right now, we have tens of thousands of jobs available in the state of Utah, high paying jobs, and we don't have enough people to fill those jobs. It's a good problem to have, it's still a problem. And yet, we have many communities, especially in rural Utah, think of places like Price, uh, in Carbon County, where you unemployment is eight percent. You know we're we're basking in three percent unemployment, and yet we have counties with eight percent unemployment. And these are people who, not just for their whole careers, but for generations, have worked in coal mines and, and in other areas, and now find themselves without these jobs that they've known and no hope for future for future jobs. So we have an alignment problem. 
So as we looked at the data, it turns out that work-based education is a really good thing. If you can get kids in high school actually some on-the-job training, uh, it's good for employers, right? Because employers need employees, and this is this is helpful to them. But it, but, but something remarkable happened. It turns out it's even better for the students. Minority kids, there were some studies done in California, and, and minority kids who had some sort, sort of work-based learning opportunity during high school were twice as likely to go to college. They were much more likely to graduate from high school in the first place, and their test scores improved. Uh, so sitting in a classroom staring at a chalkboard isn't the best way to learn, especially for a younger generation. But hands-on experience is life-changing and life-affirming. And so as we started to look at that, um, we, we met with some, some people in the tech sector, specifically in aerospace. And they said, look, we, we have some of the biggest aerospace companies in the world right here. So think of Boeing, you know, the big guys, they're all here, and they're making stuff for airplanes. And they need workers, and they can't get enough workers to work for them who are trained and, 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 and ready to go. And they're pretty good paying jobs. So they said, what if, we worked with some school districts and developed a curriculum where kids could actually come, spend part of their day with us, get some on-the-job training, training, get credit for that, graduate from high school, not just with their high school degree, but with a certificate in aerospace manufacturing. So right out of the gate, they have the certificate, they can go get a job just about anywhere they want. The pays very well. If that's what they want, they can get their life started, start a family, uh, have a career, and that's great. If they don't, if they want more education, we encourage that too. And in fact, many of these companies will help pay for their education if they want to go on, get a bachelor's degree or something else. So we did this a couple years ago, and it, it, it's been enormously successful. So we started to broaden and think, we, we can do more. We, this is a model that works. What can we do? So we went around, we found some, uh, in fact, it was the um, the National Governors Association said, we're interested in this, we have some money available, we want to help you guys, here's two plus million dollars, um, go see what you can do and figure this out. So a few months ago, the governor, uh, the governor announced what is called Talent Ready Utah. Um, if you get a chance, I encourage you to get on the website and just see a little bit about what Talent Ready Utah is about. I think it's talentreadyutah.org. And this idea is we're expanding this everywhere. Uh, to hundreds if not thousands of, of potential employers and this is for you okay this is this is important um, going back to my business when I got there when I came back uh, I said let's do something for education in our small title one rural communities let's teach them entrepreneur skills let's raise money and go in so we partnered with junior achievement we went in and so for uh, for the past uh, eight years Every year, I go volunteer in a classroom of sixth graders, and I teach them entrepreneur skills. And it's been unbelievable to see the way that their lives have changed, and the way it's changed the culture of our company. By giving back, and our employees, I, I, our employees go and teach these classes to kids, it's, it's just changed their world. And uh, it, it's, it's good for you, it's good for the business. Our bottom line actually improved as we uh, had more volunteer opportunities for, our, uh, for our, our employees, and again, the kids benefited from this. But we're talking about something more than this. We're not just talking about teaching them entrepreneur skills, although that's important. Uh, we're, everything is on the table. Anything you can do in your business to, uh, to help to, to, to bring kids in, high school kids in, we want to talk to you. And uh, we want you to work with your local school districts. This isn't a one-size-fits-all program. This is, look, we could have one intern in our office. If it's, if it's one intern for two months every year, do that. Uh, if it's something bigger in Heber City, they're doing some great things. They're bringing, companies are, are coming in with groups of kids who have to apply for these, these jobs. Um, and they're giving them real life experience. They're, they're working on, they'll have a, a group that is, is working on um, uh, advertising. So, so they, they bring these kids in with the experts of the company. They come up with, with new advertising ideas, marketing ideas. They pitch those ideas. They help film the ads. Uh, they, they help update the websites. I mean, they're, they're doing, again, on, on the job training. 
that will, will help them for years. Now, when they go to college, if they go to college, I mean, they're, they're teaching the classes, right? I mean, they, they, know, they know what's happening even better than sometimes uh, our, our, our good people in higher ed. It's been truly remarkable. Uh, there, there's another group that, that is interested in, in crunching numbers, and so they're spending time side by side with accountants on, on real projects, accounting projects. And uh, again, they have a professional there helping them check their work, but it's, uh, it's really changing the way we educate people. And that's what we need. So we're not here to tell you uh, how we're going to solve this. We don't believe that. By the way, if, if, you're, if you're waiting for the politicians to solve the problems in society, um, I don't know what to tell you, but uh, it's, it's not going to happen. I'm just, I, I, I tell you, and I mean that not as a partisan, I mean that as somebody who's doing this. I, people ask me, what have you learned in three and a half years of being a lieutenant governor? And, and I'll tell you in closing what I've learned is that um, the government is terrible at just about everything it does. Again, I don't mean that as a conservative Republican and we need less government. I, I mean that sincerely from the bottom of my heart. I used, to, uh, I used to wake up every morning with a great idea and I would go to work and by the end of that day we had implemented that idea and things were rolling. Today, I wake up with great ideas every morning and if I'm lucky, in three years, a part of that idea, a bastardized part of that idea, may have been implemented in some form or fashion. All right, That's, that's just the way it works. Now, that's, that's okay. That's how government was designed. Okay? Government was designed to, be, uh, to, to, to not be nimble. It was designed to be very slow very methodical, not changing very much over time. Uh, that's not where we are as a society today. That doesn't mean government should change. What it means is we need you. We need you more than ever to give back, to step up, to innovate in this sphere. And we need to do it as a partnership because you are bright, you are nimble, you are innovative. All the things that government tends not to be. And so as we move forward in this project, uh, we, we look forward to hearing from you. We look forward to working with you. We, we look forward to improving education in this state because the government, the governor made another promise. He said, just like I said, we could be the number one economy and global that business destination and everyone laughed at me. I believe that Utah can have the best education system in the United States. A lot of people laughed at me because again, we don't have the funding sources that other states have. But I believe we have something else. I believe we have the entrepreneurial spirit. I believe we're hard workers, and I believe that we give back. And that's a recipe for success, whether you're starting a business or you're transforming the education. Thanks for letting me come. Keep up the good work, and uh, God bless you. Thank you. And let's give it up one more time for Lieutenant Governor Cox, please.